Hello, I'm Grant from Maker's Vlog, and today, well, it was actually today, it was a few days ago, uh, well, a few weeks ago by the time you see this, but a few days for me, um, I put up a video showing off some of my amateur radio kit, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised with the, the amount of responses that it got, it was, it was quite popular, I had more amateur radio people follow me than what I thought, or at least a few more, um, there's also a few that I know in real life who follow the channel now. Um, did not see that one coming. They know who they are. Oh, geez. Um, But I had a few people asking um, about, you know, showing an actual build of a kit. And I, I know I've been very bad at that so far of actually showing the build process from the whole way through. Mainly because I, I record all these on my phone and it's a pain in the ass to record soldering in each, each bit. And it's a pain in the ass to, um, uh, to edit as well. But People have asked for it, so I thought I would do it. And I thought a good one to start, mainly because it's the one that I have lying about, is this. And this is a Pixie kit. Anyone who's in amateur radio will, will have heard about these. Um, they are very cheap. They're a couple of pounds-ish, maybe a bit more. Um, they are cheap HF uh, transceivers. So um, pretty decent for the price, but I mean, uh, they're they're... Uh, for the price, it's amazing, but as an HF rig, they're, they're next to useless. But um, for anyone who's wanting to get into kit building and stuff like that, they are fantastic practice. They are that cheap, and you get that many components um, with them. They're even good to get just to get some spares of common components, because most of the components that are used in this are common in a lot of different transceivers. Um, so it's even good for spare parts, but it's definitely good for practice. Uh, it's a 40 meter. Uh, band radio, so uh, 7 megahertz range-ish, it, it's quite limited in, in its range, uh, and it's uh, CW only, so it's Morse code only, but again, I, I, I wouldn't be getting this with the expectation of actually being able to talk to anyone, um, I don't think I've ever managed to make a contact on one of these, ever, but there are people who have, and there, there are modifications that you can do to this, uh, that you know make it a lot better on receive and transmit even giving a bit more power and if you are um, going to transmit using one of these um, you're, go you're going to need to build a low pass filter because um, spurious signals are just everywhere on this thing you'll be transmitting on 7 megahertz you'll be I mean there'll be someone in the 2 meter band will hear you on this thing for flip sake if you, if you put too much power into it so yeah, be aware if, if you're going to do any modifications to this and make it better, a low pass filter is definitely going to need to be one of them. Um, I, I did have someone que uh, query on one of the uh, the videos um, saying that maybe this isn't a good thing for a beginner because a beginner, uh, a foundation licensee can't build kits. And that's, that's incorrect. A foundation licensee can build kits. What they can't do is, I can see he's, I can see he's going into the comments right now frothing at the mouth. Um, but uh, uh, they can't, it's, you can't design and build your own transmitters. It's, it's very specific in design and build your own. Um, it does say that if it's from a kit, you can build it. If it's a pre-designed kit, you can. It's the actual design of the transceivers um, that you're, you're not allowed to do as a foundation li licensee because uh, it's, unless you work in the industry, you won't know enough about them to be able to build them effectively and without causing uh, interference, which is the big thing. Um, so you can you you can build from kits, so no worries there. So right, let's uh, uh, get in, and I'll uh, I'll show you how to build this. Okay, so the Pixie kit, this is it in its entirety, and the good thing about this is because it's quite a uh, small kit, all of the components are quite nice and neatly uh, bagged up and ready to go. So you've got your uh, resistors in here. Uh, capacitors and then in here is sort of miscellaneous one-off components so there's only a couple of, of each item in here uh, so like so your crystal your IC stuff like that if you don't know what those components are don't worry we'll go through them uh, and then over here you've got your uh, hardware so uh, potentiometer not really hardware but potentiometer uh, power jack audio jack and a buzzer and then got an acrylic case. I uh, won't be worrying too much about this, uh, mainly because I've stolen the screws out of this kit. I said before, these kits are good for spare parts. 
and case in point I stole the uh, screws and feet to put onto uh, this auto tuner that I'm in the process of building uh, just to get it yeah just to raise it up so it's not sitting on the workbench uh, and then the important bit the PCB uh, if you've never built a kit before your the, the PCB you'll see here has a, what's called a silk screen on it which has effectively labels so everything is labeled as to what is what starting off you probably won't recognize some of the symbols but you get to know them fairly quickly they're, they're not difficult they they look in most cases like the component so this here's a little uh, rectangle r1 that's a resistor uh, this one here is a little rectangle with a uh, dashed line here that's a diode and you'll see that whenever we get to putting the diode in that that is what the diode looks like this kit has uh, instructions online they're quite good um, I'll put a link to them in the description I don't usually run through them uh, for this particular kit if you're building a larger kit I, I do and, and definitely follow the instructions but for this one because the components are so simple all I work off um, is this sheet here which is the list of components and it basically tells you that um, resistor 7 is a 10 ohm resistor resistor 4 is a 470 ohm resistor and I just line that up with what's on the board so I look for R7 and I match that up with the correct value resistor now for the resistors don't worry too much about not being able to read the color code uh, because if you have a multimeter which you should if you're building this uh, uh, really the the equipment you need is, is a multimeter ideally and, and a soldering iron and some solder that's that's all you need uh, you can do this without a resistor but it means you are sorry without a, a multimeter but it means that you're going to need to be able to read the resistor values if you don't work in the industry it can be quite um, strange to look at I generally don't I just uh, measure them you can read them and there is a chart in the instructions that tells you how to read them and uh, but generally I, I check them anyway just to make sure checking them individually sounds a bit fiddly but bear in mind that there are not a lot of resistors in this kit and usually whenever you get a kit the, the resistors will be in in a long strip and they'll be labeled so all the one kilo ohm resistors will be in a strip and it'll be labeled as one kilo ohm all the uh, you know 10k resistors will be in a strip and labeled generally i still go in and check at least one from each strip to make sure that they haven't been mislabeled or anything like that but it's not uh, it's not individually checking hundreds of resistors you don't need to and for this one there is only a handful and usually they give you a few spares as well how you want to start is entirely up to you uh, usually I like to start with the uh, resistors and capacitors and, and do essentially the, the largest quantity of components first. Depending on the kit, some of them will have you do larger components, um, as in physically larger, not, not large in quantity. Um, they'll have you do the larger components first, uh, like uh, toroids or, or transformers or, or things like that, just because it's easier to fit them whenever you're not having to work around other smaller components. But in those larger kits, um, you'd be following the instructions in a way and they're all very good at telling you that, that you know you, you should fit this first or if you're uncomfortable with X, Y, Z, maybe do this first. The instructions on a lot of these kits are very, very good. Um, be aware that whenever you're ordering a kit from China, the instructions generally aren't always as good. Uh, this uh, one, this Pixie kit is the exception because it's been around for ages and it's been you know modified and changed and tweaked a hundred times over so for this kit the instructions are really good but if you are getting something else from china they may not be so a, uh, a little tray or container of some shape or form is quite handy to keep all your resistors together i don't have one but i'm not too afraid of losing any because i have a ton of spares if you don't put them in a container so you don't lose them um and the way that i do these is effectively i just take a random one out measure the resistance and then line that up with this sheet uh, and find which which value it matches and fit it and then i just go through and do them all and i cross them off as as i go yeah so that's the 470 ohm so that is if we look at the sheet that is resistor four so you find that on the pcb uh, if your eyesight is not fantastic you may want a uh, magnifying glass but there it is there that 
one there is R4. And doing these kits, like I said, a lot of people get concerned about doing them and worried and, uh, about building them, but it is, it is just a giant jigsaw puzzle. That's all it is. So that's it. Once it's in, I then just bend the legs ever so slightly so that it stays in place. And we'll do that for all the resistors. So that's all of the uh, resistors in place. And what you can do here is you can either now go in and, and solder all of the resistors or you can do the capacitors as well. Um, I like to do the resistors now just because I find if there's not too much on the board and I'm soldering everything, I tend to miss connections. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and solder these uh, to the board and then I'm going to start doing the capacitors. Uh, as I said, they give you plenty of spares. That's that's how many is left over. I think they nearly give you two of, of each uh, uh, resistor. So again, for spur parts, these kits, very handy. So let's flip this over and start soldering. So, uh, this is not going to be an introduction to soldering, because there are people who do it a hell of a lot better than me. But, um, just as a, a quick show, uh, basically all you do is you apply the heat, bring in the solder, blob the solder on there, and take the heat away. Uh, it's nothing too difficult, so apply the heat, blob the solder, and that's it. Easy as that. Uh, the idea is to do it as, as quickly as you can within reason. So don't hang about if you don't need to. It doesn't matter too much for resistors and the likes. But for um, anything that's potentially sensitive. So the likes of an IC. And it's an integrated circuit. Or some transistors. Uh, generally they don't like too much heat. Um, so try not to uh, get too close to the uh, fumes. They are not good to breathe in. And really, if you're doing this for any length of time, you should have a uh, uh, an extractor fan of some shape or form. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Even just a, a desktop fan that's blowing the smoke away from your face is, is sufficient. Now what you can do is you can go ahead and snip off the extra leads, uh, either good pair of scissors or a pair of wire snips. Um, if this is your first time building a kit and you're not confident, don't do that yet. Wait till the end until you've tested it because if you snip off the leads and you realise that a component's in the wrong place, it's then more awkward to um, put it into the right place because the, the leads are a lot shorter. Whereas if they're still the same length, you can take them out and uh, put them back in rather easily. So, capacitors are now in here. And these are a lot easier than the resistors because you don't need to check their values necessarily because they are all um, plainly labelled. You'll see here C1, C10 are uh, 0.1 microfarad. Um, that number 104 uh, corresponds to a number actually on the, the capacitor itself. Um, it might be very difficult for you to see that. It is quite small, but it is on there. And if you've got a magnifying glass, you'll be able to read it quite easily. So that is a 103. And that's them um, grouped up there. So let's uh, add these in now. That's it, and that is all of the capacitors done. Now, the next one that I like to do is the inductors, and they are a little bit more awkward. This is them here. They look a little bit like um, resistors, but they're sort of stumpy with a narrow middle. And the, the values of these, you need to look at the chart, because um, unless you have something that's able to measure inductance, which a standard multimeter won't be able to do, you need to be able to read the rings. Um, the uh, instructions have uh, the charts of, of how to do this. Or if you happen to have one, a little device like this, it's a little multifunction tester, it's able to tell you quite easily. These aren't 
that expensive and if you're planning to do a lot of kits and start getting into them uh, this wee tester is quite good for a whole range of components so handy thing to have um, but you definitely don't need it the, the rings are, are a lot clearer on the inductors than they are on some of these resistors and that's it that's the inductors in place they're all labeled as uh, l1 l2 l3 whatever the the next thing that i like to do is the electrolytic capacitors now point to note with these is that they have a polarity so they have a right and wrong way of going in everything that we've been putting in so far is uh, anyway whichever way around you put it in it'll work these not so but the silk screen on the board is labeled in such a way to to help you with that the good thing with these capacitors as well their values are written quite clearly on them I know you may not be able to see that there, but they're uh, quite clearly marked. And again, magnifying glass if, if your eyesight's not quite as good. Uh, so this one, I believe, is capacitor 1. So it's a 100 uh, microfarad. It says it on there. So that is capacitor 1, which is just here. And you'll see that the circle has half of it coloured in. Hopefully you can see that. And that indicates this bit here on the uh, capacitor there is like a, a, a grey bar and that lines up with the highlighted half on the silk screen it also has a longer leg and a shorter leg the uh, the shorter leg goes into the uh, uh, highlighted half the only other thing with these is don't push them down all the way leave a little bit of a gap just because this is one of the components that can be sensitive to heat. It's not a big issue at all, but just if they're right up against the board and you're taking a long time to put the solder on, uh, they can get damaged. So just giving them that little bit of height uh, helps protect them in case uh, in case you're on the solder for, for too long. So let's fit all of them. And that is all the electrolytic capacitors done. The next thing, bit of an important one, but... Um, uh, definitely not difficult and that is the IC socket so this is the integrated circuit socket so the whole idea behind this is that you you solder this in and then you can plug the integrated circuit straight in and it means that you're not uh, soldering the circuit to the board helps protect the circuit because they can be sensitive to heat as well and it also means that if the circuit ever fails uh, it's it's easier to fix but some people find these a little bit difficult now again there's a right and a wrong way to put these on it might be hard to see, but there's a little notch in this um, uh, socket. And there's also a little notch on the silk screen. The, the little rectangle outline has that notch in there. And so you need to line them up. And then you just slot it in. Like so. Now, the difficulty is, the pins on this are quite short. So if I let go of this, it will just fall. And uh, it, won't, it won't stay seated long enough for me to, to solder it. So what you have to do is a um, little bit of bad practice, but the idea is, is that you actually carry, at least the way that I do it, and it's probably wrong, is that you carry a bit of solder over to it, which is usually a bad practice. So what you do is blob a bit of solder on there, hold the IC in place, and then um, solder one of the pins, just one, because it's going to get very hot, so you want to be quick. Like that, not very neat, but it uh, it'll do the job, and that keeps it in place long enough for you to um, actually solder it. Uh, and then whenever you've got the other pin soldered, come back and then tidy up that first one. And that's it. And that is the IC socket ready to rock. Uh, don't slot the IC in yet. Uh, generally, I leave that till the end because we're still going to be soldering, and we don't want to risk. Uh, potentially damaging it from overheating it's unlikely and um, so it's not the end of the world if you have already slotted it in but generally I, I leave it till last okay the next thing that I start to put in is the transistors and there's a couple of different types but they are all they're all fairly well labeled from the only awkward one here is d1 which is a a bridge rectifier ic and it looks like this is a little round thing with uh, four legs one of them longer than the other and it lines up to this little rectangular circuit here 
Now on it, it's a bit hard to see here, but it does have a plus and minus, and that lines up to the plus and minus on the board. The long lead is the is the positive. <clears throat> and that's it. So now because we're nearly on the home stretch, um I, I start putting a few more components in before I flip over to uh, uh to solder it. So the next thing that I'm going to do is D2, which is a diode, which is this little boy over here, I believe. Let me just double check that. Yep, which is this one here. Now, I've actually just noticed that this one is damaged. Uh, you can see there it's been chipped away, and I don't actually have a spare one of these. I'm not going to be using this, so I'm just going to solder it in place and make a note. I can fix that later. Um, it may still work, but it just looks like the outer casing has been damaged. So that's something to check. So I'm going to bend the pins. And this is D2, which goes here just beside D1. And I'd said before about that little band. And you can potentially see there the little grey band there on one side of the diode. And that's you need to line them up. So that's that one in place. So I'm going to score that one off too. And then uh, Q1 and Q2, which are triodes. Which I think is actually incorrect, but well, yeah. A triode to me has always been a a glass valve tube. If you Google them, you'll see them, but this could be a new variant. Uh, I'm not sure. But there are two different types, and they are labelled. It is written on the flat face. It is a bit hard to see. So this, this one is uh, 9018, so that is Q1. Which uh, just goes in here. Again... Uh, there's a right and a wrong way to put this in. The silk screen um, matches the shape of the uh, transistor, and in this case, the flat edge. So line up the flat edge on this with the flat edge on this PCB, and you won't go too far wrong. Uh, in some cases, you need to bend the pins just to um, stretch them out so that they fit. And then this is Q2, which just goes in just beside it there. Again, making sure to line it up. Next diode is D3, and this is a little glass diode, you can see it there, and on it it has a little black band, it's probably quite hard to see there, but that lines up in the same way as the silver band of the other one. That's that one, and then the last one is uh, the LED, which I'm sure a lot of you are probably very familiar with, it's a light emitting diode. And it goes here, and again there is a small flat edge on the diode. On this LED, and you line it up with the flat edge on the silk screen. I'm going to solder all them. Okay, and now we're nearly done with components, so we're now going to fit in the crystal, which dictates the uh, frequency that this will operate on, and it just goes in here. Now, this doesn't matter which way around it goes, and that is the last of the main components. Okay, so next thing I'm going to put in is going to be the potentiometer, this monstrosity looking thing here. And it effectively just goes right smack dab in the middle, but it may take a little bit of fiddling just to get it lined up. And that's it, that's the potentiometer in. Fairly straightforward. Um, if you're Soldering iron has the uh, ability to turn up the temperature and um, this would be the component to turn it up a bit far away to uh, closer to 380, 390, something like that. Um, just because this metal case, it can, it can wick away the heat quite easily. So all we need to start installing now is the uh, jack, which is this little component here, which just goes in here. And this is uh, to enable you to be able to um, turn on and off the uh, buzzer playback so whenever you key on this it will buzz and um, to indicate so that you can hear what you're keying uh, and this just has a little jumper on it so that you can disable that. Uh, next we're going to fit the headphone jacks which just go on here there's one for the headphone and one for the care and that's the um, care and uh, audio jack plugged in. Um, some people don't like putting this potentiometer in um, at this at this stage because it then means that whenever you set it, it's at an angle. Um, I prefer that just because I found that putting these in, the the keyer and a few other of the other components, 
Um, having it at an angle like that actually means that they stay in place a bit easier whenever you're soldering and getting that initial connection on. That's just me, personal preference. Um, any of these last components, really, in, in fact, any of these components, you can do whichever way around you want. Uh, it's just what you personally find easy or and or difficult. So for me, I find it doing that, that way is, is easiest. I mean, you can try it for yourself and see. So next thing, I'm gonna put in the uh, the buzzer. Um, the pins are a bit bent on this. Then next is the uh, power jack. Uh, this little kit takes uh, 12 volts. And again, if you're having trouble keeping it in place, you can um, carry a bit of solder over to it while you're holding it. Just make sure that if you're doing that, uh, carrying the solder over method, um, make sure that you go over that connection again because carrying the solder over it, it can lead to a dry joint quite easily and you you really don't want that and then lastly is the bnc uh, connector this one may not fit too well just because um I'd, I'd already stolen the bnc connector out of this kit uh, a while ago and so i've had to salvage this one back so the pins may not reach too well uh, no it looks like it's gonna work okay Okay, and that is it for all of the solder. And the last thing to do is to put the IC in. And again, as, as I'd said to you before, there's a little notch in that. And that lines up to the notch in the socket. And it literally just slots in. But that's it. That's it, ready to rock and roll. So that's it. That's, uh, that's how easy it is. And this is a now a small... Uh, QRP, low power, 40 megahertz, uh, or sorry, 40, uh, 40 meter band transmitter. This this will transmit uh, and receive. Not very well, I'll grant you, because it is cheap and cheerful. But that's how easy it is to build kits, and for practicing, these wee kits are absolutely fantastic. And for spare components, like um, as you've seen during the, the build of that, I, you know, I, uh, I'd stolen parts of this for other projects, left, right and centre, um, and I have a couple of these. They are, uh, they're very good bits of kit. So, that's it. If you've uh, liked, subscribe, all that good stuff, and um, if you want to see more radio-related projects, uh, let me know in the description. And if you have any ideas of stuff that I can do, let me know, and uh, yeah, I'll get cracking with them. Cheers.